Good evening, everyone. It's time for our Revelation study for this week. I want to welcome you to our Tuesdays for the Thirsty Brothers and Sisters. Ah, what a week it's been. Lots of activity, lots of things going on in the world. Lots of things we could talk about. I want to talk about our favorite thing tonight, and that it's Jesus and how he is revealed in the scriptures and how we see him and how he shows himself to us. So I'm glad you're here for this study. And this week we're going to be looking at, we're still in Revelation 6, but we are to the fifth seal and the breaking of the seals. We've covered all of uh, the horsemen so far. And we've covered lots of things. So go back and review this study if you haven't seen other things. Uh, everything from the overview and every lesson so far is, uh, is in the unit. And you can review those at your leisure and um, lay the same foundation that we've been laying all along. So right now I'd like to ask the Lord if he would grace us with his presence if he would anoint our study tonight, anoint my heart that I can relay uh, what I found in the scriptures and anoint your ears and your heart to receive what I will say tonight. Again, we're in a part of this particular revelation that is somewhat difficult. Uh, it has uh, a lot of troubling imagery and symbology in it. So we want to uh, be confirmed in our faith and not shaken in our faith when we look at these things. So if you would, you can join me in prayer. Our Lord God, how gracious you are to us because you tell us the things that will come to pass to witness to us that you are who you say you are and you will do what you say you will do. And those things that you have unfolded to us in the scripture we know that that's for our edification, it's for our comfort, it's, it's to admonish us, it's to warn us, it's to help us be prepared for your coming. And so, Lord, we ask that you would do that tonight with us, that you would be in our midst, that you would help us to understand and to apply your word. And we commit this time to you, Jesus, because you're worthy. You're worthy of all and everything. In your name, Lord, we pray. Amen. Okay, so um, I'd like to start tonight. Uh, we are in Revelation 6, and we are in the ninth verse, and I want to read that to you, and we'll jump right in tonight. And Revelation 6, 9 says, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. You know, once you're quickened to this revelation, you'll, you really won't read the rest of the Bible in the same way again. Uh, not just the revelation of this particular verse or this particular chapter, but of this book in its entirety, um, we see that Christ himself is revealed in the entire Bible, and we know that God's theme from Genesis 1 to the end of Revelation 22 is one thing. And I've said many times before, there are topical sermons by the hundreds or thousands included in the scripture. But there is only one theme of God. 
and that is the revealing, the unveiling of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this book, this revelation book, is the summary of every book in your Bible. And now it's the fullest revelation that we are given in the entire canon. And it's revealing Christ in a way that we have not seen him before. You know, to find Jesus, to find him in this particular book of the Bible is why we're studying this Bible. It's not to know the future, although it will tell us things that will come to pass. And it's not to know the past because we can find the past other places all through Scripture. And we can read human history according to the word of man. But we want God's word on this particular time that we're in and the days that are coming upon us. And we want his particular revelation to us about how they will unfold and how we will be kept in the midst of all this chaos. You know, this book is actually not a book about the tribulation. And I know we have a tendency to view it that way. It is not. Now, the revelation of the tribulation is in it. You know, uh, it's not a book about the Antichrist, although the Antichrist is in this book. It's not a book about the ten nation confederation. We can try to figure out exactly who those ten nations are, and there's nothing wrong with that, but that's not what we're looking for in this book. It's not the New World Order. It's not a New World Church. It's not Russia. It's not China. It's not Satan being bound or any of that. However, all of that is in this book, as we know. It's not about any of that, it's all there. But it's about the theme. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ revealed as he is. And as he is, he does not change. So the revelations that we've been given in other books are impartial. They're just a partial glimpse of him. This is the fullest revelation available. Human history, or the future, is not the theme of this book. And it, it, you know, human history or the unfolding of future events are simply a stage upon which Christ will appear. It's the stage. You've heard me say many times, there are those who walk the path hoping to find Jesus. But if your eyes are on Jesus, you will be on the right path. We can, we can study all about the path and totally miss the Lord. And it's kind of the same thing in this book. We can study all of the events and miss the Lord in it. So we know that we're looking for two things particularly in this book. We're looking for the lamb that was slain because that is our atonement. That is our passage to the presence of God without walls or hindrances. And at his appointed time, all of the obstacles will be taken down. And we're looking for the lamb on the throne because the lamb on the throne means the fulfillment to the very jot and tittle of everything that has been promised to us and to mankind by God. So you can study the stage and what we're doing now is we're looking at the stage and all of these things that we're seeing, we see the four and twenty elders, we see the throne room, we see our kinsman redeemer, we see the lampstands, uh, we see uh, the living creatures, we see the super angels, right? We see all of these things and they are the stage for the one that we're looking for. So we can we can look at the curtains on the stage. We can see the stage itself. We can see um, the lighting on the stage. We can see the props on the stage, the furniture, whatever is on the stage. 
And if we're studying that too closely, we can actually miss the main performer. And that's the Lord Jesus. So, you know, there are lots of experts on the stage. Lots of experts on the staging. And uh, I'm not one of them. I'm just bringing to you what I'm finding in the scripture. But I am somewhat of an expert of he who will take the stage. Uh, do we do we have a signal? Are we okay? Guys, tell me in the... I can begin it again. Can anyone uh, text me and see? I can start this again. Jilly, are you on? Can you text me in the thread or someone? I see there are a couple comments. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hmm. Maybe I should start this again. Can someone give me any comment? Should I start? Get back in and pick it up. Okay. I'm good. Okay. All right. Thanks, honey. <laughs> All right. Okay. So we want to know who the main actor is on the stage, the main character, because that, that's who the stage is set for. So I hope you understand my meaning in all of this, that all of these things, all of this symbology, it's not that it is not true. It's not that it is not actual. It is not that they are not uh, players on the stage, but there is one main character, one main person on the stage. And that's who we're looking for. Now, we know that Jesus is called the Lamb in this book more than any other book in the Bible. And we also know that the throne is referenced more than 40 times in this book. And in Romans, we know that our physical world is already experiencing labor pains. And we know we're experiencing them right along with the earth that we inhabit. This has been going on not just in the 11th hour of the time we have, but it's been going on since Jesus left this earth and ascended. And we know that because we know that the work of Christ was finished on the cross, and we know that, that Paul told us that even now uh, the Antichrist was on the earth. And we know that all these things have been unfolding for a long time. We just know that we're closer to the end than we were at the beginning, right? We... And the reason I'm going over this is we need to remind ourselves every single day, as we look at these martyrs, we know that there have been those that have been martyred since the time of Christ. And, um, and there were those who were martyred even before the time of Christ for their witness of God and His covenant and His covenant people. So, I just want to to remind you a little bit that there is nothing, absolutely nothing, in this earth, under the earth, above the earth, that has happened that has been out of the control of our God. He has never, not for an instant, relinquished his sovereignty over what is happening. Neither will he. And so as we continue to look at these very troubling things that we see in the book of Revelation, you know, you need to understand. We, people often view this book as, well, Satan is running roughshod. And because Satan's in control, he is not in control. So I want to point some things out about that. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2 Verses 6 through 10 says this, And now you know 
what withholdeth or withstrains, that he, speaking of the lawless one, might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he, and he's referring to the restrainer here, the, the Holy Spirit, only he who now letteth will let until he, the restrainer, be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked one, the Antichrist, be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even he, the Antichrist, this is who he's referring to there, whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they may be saved. Remember, the Antichrist does not determine when he comes. Our God determines when he comes, when he is allowed to come upon the scene. And these events that are triggered in heaven, the same, it is the same with them. The events that are triggered in heaven that bring about the events on the earth, God is in charge. No one else is in charge. His enemies are not in charge. Man is not in charge. Christ is removing the seals. He's in charge. No man determines the timing of any of this. Not any event from, from the time the seals begin to be opened. The timing is God's. We looked at with the first horseman, the crown that he was given. You know, he is allowed. He is allowed. Why, uh, why does the scripture say a crown is given? And who gives that crown to him to conquer? Who gives him the ability? Who allows him to conquer? Given by who? And for what purpose? I mean, we've already discussed that. But the unleashing of these events is through God's sovereign hand, not the Antichrist's commencing of anything. It was granted unto him. That's what it says in verse 8. It is granted unto him. And authority was given unto them in verse 11. And it says it was given unto each of them, talking about hell and death. Over and over we see that what they do is not according to their own decision. It was given to them and they were, what they were given to do was by the sovereign hand of God. So you need to understand what we're experiencing now is mostly man visiting his wickedness upon man. But, we're, but the, the earth and everything in it is quickly moving toward a time when these things will be unleashed. And they're not unleashed by the Antichrist. They are unleashed by the hand of God. And so the reason I'm saying that, that in this way is I want you to understand that even the devil is a tool only in the hands of God. What God allows, he allows for a reason. And it's not for a no good reason. It's for a very good reason. See, I want you to understand, God is running the show, always. Man does things and he thinks he's in control. He only does what God allows. God has allowed him to have free will. But these events that are coming are by God's command, not anyone else's. And when Christ returns, he'll put down governments, he'll put down war, he will put down death, and the evil schemes of men and the enemies of God. The whole framework of nature will be jarred 
as the king returns to set all things in order and to restore righteousness. The fifth symbol refers specifically to those who have died for the cause of Christ. They are specifically identified differently than others who we see that are dead in Christ. So understand, these are specifically, we're talking about martyrs. When we talk about those in heaven who are under the altar, crying how long. Now the definition of the word martyr is witness. And these held their witness unto death and met death because of their witness. There are many that are dead in Christ. My parents are dead in Christ. They were not martyred. So this is a whole different group designated by John in the writing of Revelation that identifies them as a separate group. You know, everyone is afraid of so many things. But we can't live with the fear, and I've said this many, many times. Let me pull my paper clip off here. You know, people are afraid of viruses, of biotech, of wars, of floods, of earthquakes, of all of these things that we've already talked about. But these things are already prophesied from God. Man thinks he can stop it. Man thinks he can change it. He thinks he can change what God says. He can reinterpret what God says. He can reinvent what God says and invent God in his own image. God will have none of that. And God has the only say, the only and final say. Will these things come upon man? Yes, they will. Yes, they will. Some of them at man's hand, allowed by God. Some of them by the evil one's hand, allowed by God, and some of them poured out from God's hand himself in the wrath of the Lamb. They will be permissible by God. So again, we want to be ready. We don't know at the imminent turn, return of Christ when he calls his bride. We don't know when that is. We just know we need to be and want to be ready. People blame each other. People blame each other. And in blaming each other, as long as they do blame each other, they refuse to take responsibility for their own choices, their own will, and their own uh, willingness to accept what God has said and appropriate it. You know, it's one thing to say, I believe in God. It's another thing to live as though you do. It's one thing to say, I've accepted God as, as the sovereign over my life. It's another thing to allow him to reign over your life willingly. Not just willingly, but gratefully. Those are two different things. And we see a world that is filled with people who are so resistant and so rebellious and and it defies my understanding on so many levels until I take it down to the bottom line. God himself has said man will and there we have it. Man does. He has. He does. And he will. And so as we see these things you know, our culture makes movies and entertainment out of all this stuff. And everybody thinks it's all fun and games. Till it's not fun and games anymore. The reality is coming. Revelation 6-9 says this. And this brings us to our study tonight. And when he opened the fifth seal... I saw under the altar those that had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried in a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge 
and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. Then a white robe was given to each one of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. Notice, I want you to notice in this passage that they are calling out with a loud voice. One voice. They are calling with one voice. One voice united. Not many voices at the same time. That's not what it says. It doesn't say many voices cried out loudly. It says, and they cried out with one voice. It's interesting. They're individuals, but they speak with a singularity of purpose, of one mind and one purpose. And notice, they are not asleep. They're fully conscious. And they're speaking with God. They ask God to intervene on their behalf and to judge the inhabitants of the earth. In other words, they're praying. They are petitioning God for his hand to move, for his purpose, which they already know, and to fulfill the prophecy that those who would be slain would be avenged by him. Those slain for him are avenged by him. So they're talking to God. They are praying. They are petitioning him. And what do we do when we petition God? Isn't that prayer? They're asking questions. They're asking a question of him. They're inquiring of him. Which means though we will be perfected in standing, perhaps this suggests that we are not yet perfected in intellect. We don't have all the answers. This group of martyrs are asking a question, not because they know the answer, but because they don't know the time yet. See, I, you know, a lot of people think that when the scripture says we will, when we see him, we will be like him. And there's a lot of theology out there that says we become gods too. No, there's one God. <laughs> there's one God, one Lord, one Savior, one King. Now we are made priests unto our God. But to say that we become God with the fullness of God, as God alone has, would make us God, equal to Him. We are not equal to Him. We are kings and priests unto our God but not as like God. So they're asking a question, which means there's an unveiling of answers in question in, in heaven by the very nature of asking the question. Because if they already knew, they'd already know, wouldn't they? <laughs> so, um, you know, it's interesting. If they knew everything, if we knew everything, we'd be God. So there is an unveiling in heaven Continuing, which I love the idea of. We continue learning. We continue seeking. We continue being given understanding. And we continue be, get to be given answers. Will our bodies be incorruptible? Yes. Will things be restored to us that we lost? Absolutely. I don't even, I can't even wrap my brain around what that looks like. But I do know what I find here is they're asking they're petitioning God for an answer they don't have. And if they were gods, as some claim that man will be, they would have the answer already, wouldn't they? Because they would be omniscient, omnipotent. And uh, clearly, if they're asking him for the answer, they're not. He will still be the only being who is omnip omniscient all-knowing, all-wise, all-knowing. And I find comfort in that. Will we rule and reign? Yes, 
Will we be given wisdom and knowledge? Yes. Will we inquire of him and need to inquire of him? I suspect so. I suspect so. And we have a perfect example here. Chapter 4 pictures heaven as a model of the tabernacle. And I just want to go back and say, because we're going to, we're, we're looking at the altar. We're looking at the martyrs that are under the altar. And I want to talk a little bit about this altar, because we find in the tabernacle, we find the table of showbread, which, which uh, is the symbol, the earthly symbol, the flesh symbol given to man of intimate fellowship with Jesus. It, it is the picture of covenant communion with him. That, is, that was his purpose. That was its purpose in the tabernacle. Uh, we've seen the, the throne room of God, and we see that equates to the Ark of the Covenant that was kept in the tabernacle, in the Holy of Holies, was where the throne of God resided. And we see the glassy sea, which is the uh, earthly equivalent of the bronze labor. We see the seven-branched candlestick, which is the symbology or the representation of the seven spirits of God dwelling among man. And then we see altars. And there were two altars. There was the place of sacrifice, and there was an altar of incense. One was bronze and one was gold. One was where the sacrifices were slain. And one where the incense was offered. John says, when he talks about this, he calls it the altar. Not one of the altars. He calls it the altar. And in this context, it is identified as associated with the people of God who were slain for their witness or their testimony. So this uniquely identifies, I believe it, as the altar of sacrifice. These martyrs are under the altar of sacrifice. And we'll see later that their prayers, which were offered on the altar of incense, their prayers, will be put into the hands of the angel who hurls them to earth in a later passage. Their prayers are as coals that are taken from the altar and put it in incense and thrown to the earth. And that's a little bit later on. We'll see that and we'll study it more then. But I want you to know that on the Day of Atonement, these things would happen in the tabernacle. So keep in mind now this altar. First the priest would sacrifice the offering on the outer altar. And he would gather the following things to take to the temple, to the inner altar. He would take some of the blood of the sacrifice. He would take a golden censer, which is a fire pan. It was a, a receptacle filled with coals, holding some of the burning coals from the outer altar. Inside the temple he would go beyond the veil or the curtain to enter the Holy of Holies. He would add incense to the hot coals in the censer and it would fill the room with smoke. He would approach the, Ar the Ark of the Covenant which represented the presence of God, and he would sprinkle the blood of the sacrifice over the mercy seat. And the mercy seat is the cover that covers the Ark of the Covenant with the tablets inside. Now we know that the first steps are complete because Christ completed them. Jesus' work on the cross is complete. 
And then we know that to come, the angel will take the censer and fill it with the fire from the altar, which are the prayers of the saints, combined with the prayer, the fire from the altar, combined with the prayers of the saints. And in that later passage, we will see that he is told to cast them down on the earth. And they are a mixture of blood and fire. You may recall that the altar of incense with, this, with the prayers of the saints was called of God a sweet savor unto him. That the prayers of the saints combined with the aroma of the sacrifice was a sweet savor unto God. It's interesting to me that these things combine to bring the judgment on the earth in one of the steps that will happen. And these martyrs have called out and, and, and petitioned God for that avenging of their deaths to come about. And he assures them it will. But that there are more to be added to them and to their numbers before the time is complete. Now this, I believe, is all of the martyrs that have died for the name of God and for the sake of Christ. But I also know that number is not yet complete in this scene because not all of the judgment of God has been poured out yet. And there are those who will be sealed unto God, who will be overcome by the beast during the great tribulation. Their numbers will be added to these. <clears throat> I think this is really something to look at here and to consider. You know, in one place in the scripture, God talks about our tears are in a vial, and our prayers rise to him as sweet incense. We should never forget that. And we should never forget that the, the act of, of petitioning God and praying will not cease even when we're in his presence. That aroma is dear to him. It's sweet to him. And it moves his hand. I want to remind you that the Bible, in its parallelism, tells us the same story. It tells us redemption story over and 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 over again. And some of these tellings overlap each other and parallel each other. But the story is the same, the theme is the same, and the outcome is the same. You know, we're told in Matthew 24, 9 through 15 in the Olivet Discourse, this. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. <coughs> Excuse me. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. When ye therefore see, shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Who readeth, let him understand. You know, Jesus is talking to the Jews. And these numbers of martyrs are going to be filled by a lot 
of Jewish lives. Jewish witnesses. He's When Jesus talks about this in Matthew 24, he's talking to the Jews. He's talking to those, he says, to those who live in Judea. Who lives in Judea? To those who are on their rooftops. Do you go up to your rooftop? This is a common practice in Israel. The roofs are, are made flat and a lot of the activities of the household as far as fellowship and entertaining take place on the roof. Jesus is talking to Jews here. He's talking to his fellow men and he's telling them these things. And he specifically says that the desecration of the temple will begin at the great tribulation. It will begin the great tribulation. And to see that they are not deceived, that they have been warned beforehand. And then he tells them of the horrific persecution that is coming. And it's specifically centered around the temple and around the Jewish nation. These people from the Jewish nation will in great number be added to these martyrs. Now, whether the church remains or not, I've told you many times, there are many great scholars who believe differently than I do. And that's perfectly acceptable. And there are many people that believe as I do, and that's perfectly acceptable. No one knows for sure, we're trying to discern what the Spirit is saying to us and what the, the Lord of the, of the Scriptures has given for us for our understanding. So either way, if we are not, we will be. We will be preserved by the hand of God one way or another. Now when I say that, I'm not saying that if you're the bride and you're still here during the tribulation, that you may not be martyred. That I may not be martyred. What I am saying is I don't believe you'll be here, but I know this if you are. There are the Lord delivers his people unfailingly every time and all the time. Here's a problem that we seem to have. We like to tell God how he's going to deliver us, and we like to tell him when he should deliver us. If we can do those two things, that makes us God. And I assure you, we're not God. He alone is God. Now, what he has promised is that there are things that we will experience, that he will deliver us from. And I'm sure that you're like me. There are many things he's delivered me from and probably many more I can't even imagine and I don't even know that he has in fact delivered me from. There are other things that I have experienced that the Lord has delivered me through. He's delivered me through those things. I've had to walk all the way through them and I came out the other side because the Lord delivered me through those things. He didn't deliver me from them. And I watched my sister who went through cancer. I've watched my husband go through cancer. He did not deliver them from them. He did not deliver my husband from cancer, but he has so far delivered him through cancer. And his understanding and his walk with God has deepened through the experience that he has gone through. God promises deliverance. Some things from, some things through. But then there's a third way that God has promised deliverance and that we see in the scriptures. And God sometimes delivers us by a thing. He delivers us by something that comes. And when I say he delivers us, for those of us who are in him, to be delivered from these decaying bodies and this decaying earth is indeed deliverance. 
Now, I don't hate life, and I don't hate all that life has to offer. But I'm looking forward to the day of the big payoff, <laughs> just to put it very bluntly. And so, when death comes upon the saints of God, upon those who are in covenant with him, when we are delivered by a thing, that is also the hand of God at work, delivering a promise of deliverance. So we needn't be afraid of these things. We need to understand that God alone chooses whether it's from a thing, through a thing, or by a thing, and when that thing will come. And settling that will settle our spirits to God's choice being our, our choice. God always chooses best for every one of us. I'm reminded of Greg and Peggy and their beautiful grandson. God will deliver you through your grief. How he will do that, I don't know. I just know that he will, because that's what he's promised. And that's what he will do. You believe in him. You trust in him. And I say this to all of us, the same. Our days are numbered of God. Our breaths are numbered of God and that which we walk through or that which we're delivered from or that which we're delivered by he is good in all of it and he will deliver his people at his appointed time he delivered these martyrs would we choose that likely not did they have the grace to trust him with their witness till deliverance came? Yes, they did, or they would not be numbered in this group. And we need to understand this. I believe firmly that he will call us up hither. Whether he does or whether he does not, will be his will, his deliverance, his time, his method, and his promise fulfilled. So don't fear it. I do rest that I think I'll be gone. But I know this, I can rest that even if I'm not, he will deliver me. And that's his promise. And I can take that. To heaven. That's where my bank is. <laughs> okay. Revelation 20. I want to I want to say to um well I kind of talked about that. I guess I didn't need my notes. I just went flying by the seat of my pants. Okay. Um I want to talk about the fact that in Revelation 20 and 4 I want to talk about this martyring. And of course, there's lots of ways to martyr someone. There's lots of ways to murder a witness. Um, and there is coming a time, and we will cover this a little bit more in depth later, but I want to cover it a little bit tonight. In Revelation 20, verse 4 starts and says, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Now we see... This means murder in the world today. And and I just want to say, you know, the when we see a word like beheaded, it's kind of terrifying to us. Um, 
because we're just we consider it such a barbaric form of execution and you do know i'm sure all of you that islamic nations often practice this most all of them still do um, and beheading by the sword is one of their preferred methods of execution it's not new and it's not new um, just because it's just not <laughs> it was practiced in the middle ages and done correctly believe it or not it has actually been described as a most merciful form of execution this is actually why the French came up with the guillotine and a priest the, um, the story is that a priest had watched an execution and it went very badly and um, there was a lot of forgive me but hacking and such going on and he went to the church and he demanded that something more merciful and instantaneously and, and instantaneous be considered as a method of execution and uh, by the way it was a form of execution for Roman citizens as well during the Roman Empire now crucifixion was not used for Roman citizens you should know that crucifixion was used for the conquered peoples uh, that's why crucifixions in and around Jerusalem were so common uh, because crucifixions really for the Roman Empire they did not crucify their own citizens that was reserved for others um, but beheadings were beheadings were used by the Roman Empire for their own citizens and you know there they had numerous and hideous tor ways of torturing and murdering others in addition to crucifixion they were they were quite creative at, with it and if, if you have never read the uh, fox's book of martyrs i want to encourage you to get a copy of that <coughs> excuse me because the stories in it will encourage you and lift you and strengthen you in your faith i believe because these are amazing stories it's much like it's not unlike the stories we hear of nero and what he did to the christians and how they sang as they went to their deaths and we think how in the world could that be how could how could they sing as they were being burned alive how could these things happen um, as they were fed to lions and I just want to say to you that what you need is given when you need it that's the promise of God you know and uh, to withstand or endure to the end when you belong to him and you've set your heart on him he will give you what you need to do what he's asking you to do I know that I know it in my soul I hope you know that too you know right now Israel is filled with unbelievers you know it and I know it many atheists uh, they're of the Jewish line but they are not believing they are not practicing Jews they are not covenant Jews and so when this when this tumult comes upon Jerusalem and this persecution and these executions you you have to know that this judgment that's falling is going to be hideous it's going to be horrific beyond what we can get our brains around now I want to encourage you again the martyrs of God are particularly precious to God I'm not saying they're more precious than you are or than I am because God does not have favorites but he does he does acknowledge the martyrs 
in a particular way that is different than the others. And I know that God's ways are really beyond our understanding. We don't easily grasp the concept of being out of time, out of time as far as a timeline. But I want to I want to briefly, let's see, what do we have? We have about five minutes. Okay, I want to briefly talk to you. I want you to consider these things that I've said about the martyrs. Because in this day and age that we're, we're living in, we see, well, I don't believe we're in the time of the tribulation yet. But we can already see that people of faith are being discriminated against, are, are being silenced, are being... This is the beginning of persecution. And so we have to recognize it for what it is. And there are Christians all over the world, believers all over the world, that have been executed for their faith. This is not something new. This has been going on as the ages have rolled. So have the executions. So I, I want you to understand that these witnesses of Christ that are under the altar, they will be avenged by God. And so will anyone else that is executed or gives their life for the cause and the gospel of Christ. There is a special distinction. And I like that there is. Um... You know, I'm going to change my mind on this sixth seal because when we're talking about, well, let's see, how much do I have to share with you? Okay, I'll go ahead. <laughs> okay, the sixth seal. So we've talked about the martyrs now. We've talked about the altar. And we've talked about, and I've told you a little bit about what's coming when those coals and those prayers, the incense of those prayers are mingled together with the blood and they are thrown to earth. Now I want to tell you about the next seal, the sixth seal. Here's what Revelation says about it. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal and lo, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became as blood and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? Now I want you to remember how this correlates to Matthew 22. And I posted that resource of a, a comparative of the two, of Revelation and what is what is described here, and of Matthew and what is described there, and their, how they run parallel in the same order. So remember, Scripture is given to confirm what is coming, so that when it comes, you will recognize it. Sun, moon, and star references in both, these are the same events in Matthew and Revelation. Now I want to take you to Isaiah because I want to show you what Isaiah says about this time. This great earthquake that will basically shake the earth in a way that moves everything out of its place. Now, we, we've had large earthquakes that moved areas out of their place, 
but we've never actually experienced something that the whole outer shell of the earth would shift. But that is what is being described here. Isaiah 13 in verse 9 begins this way. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, both cruel in wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. And I will punish the world for their evil and the wickedness for their and and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Therefore, I will shake the heavens and the earth and she shall be moved out of her place in the wrath of the Lord of hosts and in the day of his fierce anger. This is horrific. This is horrific. Isaiah 24, 1 says this, Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty, and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. And it shall be as with the people, so with the priest, as with the servant, so with the master, as with the maid, so with her mistress, as with the buyer, so with the seller, as with the lender, so with the borrower, as with the taker of usury, so with the giver of usury. The land shall be utterly emptied and utterly spoiled. For the Lord hath spoken this word. Shaking of the heavens. This is relatively the worst thing that we can imagine. The ground shaking beneath your feet so that things are undone and mountains and islands are moved out of their places. You know, the earth rippling. If you've seen uh, coverage of earthquakes, you will notice that the earth, when an earthquake happens many times, especially in recent earthquakes, you can see that the ground actually ripples and looks as though it has become liquid because it's moving apart from the un, from the shell underneath it this the, the, we just you know we talk about a 9.0 earthquake and that's devastation beyond imagining and then we look at this and i want you to recall that we've already seen that when the horsemen ride a quarter of the earth the life on the earth is destroyed we, I just, you know, the devastation is unimaginable. No one will escape this. No one that is still on the earth will escape this. And he goes to great pains to say, your money will not hide you. Your privilege will not hide you. Your, your uh, debt will not protect you. Your wealth will not protect you. Um, your, your standing no one will escape the eyes of the Lord in the day of his wrath. This is worldwide. This is an earthquake that is actually affects life worldwide. Isaiah 24, 19 says this, and I'll close with this. The earth is utterly broken down, the earth is clean dissolved, and the earth is moved exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, 
and shall be removed like a cottage, and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall punish the host of the high ones that are on high, and the kings of the earth upon the earth. Lord God, protect us from that day. You have saved us. You are saving us. And you have said you will save us from the wrath to come. Lord, if we at any time are counted among the martyrs, we know that you will give us what is needed to offer to you what is asked. But Lord, we ask that you would protect us from your wrath to come, that you would save us from the great and terrible day of the Lord. Lord, we want to be counted as those who are faithful and true to the end. For you are faithful and true to the end. Let us ponder these things, Lord. Let us consider them, the seriousness of them. And Lord, give us boldness in this time we have remaining that those that you have numbered among belonging to you would come to the knowledge if they haven't yet, that you may use us for a word or a deed to bring good news to those who will surely perish without it, without you. Help us, Lord, to do these things. Live in us. Live through us. And let us live by your faith. We commit these times to you. And we commit these things to you as well. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for being here tonight, and I'll uh, skip over to the little discussion room for a few minutes if you're there, and if you're not, and you have other things to do, don't fret, don't worry, be happy. Today, God gave you breath, and while it remains, rejoice. Okay, I love y'all. I'll see you next week. <laughs>